the actual course content today as well. We'll probably spend maybe 20 minutes um, on that. Um, it does not appear that there is anyone in North Ridgeville. Um, there's supposed to be a couple students in there. Is there anyone in North Ridgeville and can you hear me? I realize that's probably a ridiculous question because if they can't hear me they can't respond. But North Ridgeville? All right. Uh, we're in this room for a couple reasons. This is probably as good a place to start as any. Uh, there are uh, supposed to be a couple students at the North Ridgeville campus that um, are, are taking the class there. There's also an online section of, of this class. And I just put everyone in one section on Canvas so that everyone within the course is just treated like it's just one giant course. All right. And that has a number of advantages, in my opinion. Um, for the students and for me it's a little more convenient. I only have to deal with one big class instead of three little classes. Um, but I post the videos for this class and that's good for you whether you're uh, attending the, the campus section or uh, are taking it at North Ridgeville or, or taking it online. The idea is sort of like this. For the people that are taking the class online, this gives them an opportunity to enjoy the lectures as much as you do. All right, so they can view the lectures and they can see all the stuff uh, that we go over in class and, and I think that works to their benefit. It also has the advantage uh, for you that if you have to miss a class for whatever reason, you can just go and, and watch the video. All right. Um, in addition, I invite anyone from um, the, the, the web-based class, they want to come in and sit in on a lecture. Even if you've signed up for the online class, you're welcome to come in. We have plenty of room in here. You're welcome to come in and sit in on a class. Maybe if there's a particular topic that you're having a little bit of difficulty in and you would rather come in and address it in person, um, you're welcome to do that. So um, I, I think it's a win-win situation for everyone. You do have little buttons in front of you, if you notice. Those are our microphones. Um, you are welcome to, you're invited to, if you have a question, press the button. And what will happen is the camera will zoom in on you, all right, and your microphone will go on so the people at the other locations uh, uh, can hear your question. Um, a lot of people are reluctant to do that, all right. I don't know if they don't want to be zoomed in on at 9 o'clock in the morning or what. But if you don't do, if you don't press the button, I, I try to remember to repeat the question. That way, like the people online, because you know you don't have mics on you unless you press the button, and therefore, so that the people can hear you. Uh, people in North Ridgeville, can you hear me? I see people milling about. Okay, there you go. Uh, okay, but you can hear us now. Hear me now, right? Okay, good. All right. Uh, I was just explaining how the class is recorded, and for the benefit of if you miss a class or the benefit of um, um, anyone that um, you know w w wants to go and rewatch it if you miss a class or whatever. Okay, um, let me let me go, uh, review with you how the the um, information uh, concerning this class is stored on Canvas, and then we'll get into the actual class material. Again, I'm only going to hit the highlights of this. All right. Regardless of what class you are in, whether you're in the on-campus uh, class, North Ridgeville, or online, you should see CISS 216Q100. All right. So you will click on that. 
Your screen might look slightly different than mine simply because I'm the instructor and I have different privileges and so on. But the main area that we're going to look at uh, today is uh, the syllabus and the modules. I assume all of you have used Canvas. Is that true? If you have not, um, you can talk to me in lab and I can go over and hit some of the highlights. But you can send me emails and all sorts of things like that. All right. Let's start with the syllabus. All right, here it is, a little hard to read. Let's, whoops, try to make it a little bigger, anyhow. Um, the point of the top of this, I'll try to summarize and hit the high points, is that there are many different ways to contact me. Um, email is probably preferred to phone because I typically um, only check my voicemail um, when I'm on campus, but my email I check, you know, daily at least. Um, so email is probably preferred over phone. All right. Um, if you have questions, of course we have the lab period that you can ask the questions that you have. In some cases that's not sufficient, or if you're in the um, online section, you know, you're not ne necessarily always here for the lab period. There are other ways to get a hold of me. One of them is through my office hours. My office hours will be this semester, Monday and Wednesday, 11 through 1, Tuesday and Thursday, 12.30 through 1.30. Yeah, 12 through 1 or you can arrange the office hours. So if those do, don't work for you, and there's a certain time that you can meet me, talk to me about it and we can figure something out. All right, so those are the hours that I'm pretty much guaranteed to be here and, in, and be in my office, which is BU 211J. But don't think of those as like, you know, that I disappear off the face of the earth the other times, you know, because I am available and I can come in. Now, um, in the office hours, you can talk to me, um, you know, you can come in and talk to me face to face. Um, you can Skype with me. Um, one thing that I did uh, when I was injured and I was out for half a semester is I actually conducted some classes in office hours via Skype. Um, it's actually nice because I can actually see your screen and I can show you my screen and we can go back and forth and we can get problems uh, resolved that way. Um, do ask me uh, or, or do let me know if you're going to request uh, me on Skype because I get just all these spam requests and, and I want to know which one is, is legit so I don't respond to uh, a spammer. Um, or we can talk over the phone or we can talk over online chat. Um, now here's another thing that I do that, that's, that's my policy and, and it, it seems to work pretty well. Is that you are welcome to come in and sit on any of my classes lab sessions. Even different courses. All right. I have a lab, um, I have a, a lab today, your class, uh, from 10 to 11. I also have a lab from 2 to 3 p.m. on Monday and Wednesday. I also have a lab from 11.30 to 12.30 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, you're welcome to come in and sit in on any of those labs. For the most part, the lab time is the students' time to work on their assignments and, and projects and so on. So for the most part, I'm sitting there waiting for questions. Once in a while I have an activity in lab, but that's the exception. So I'm usually just sitting there and, and I can answer questions from this class as well as I can answer questions from the other classes as well. So you're welcome to come in and sit in on any of those labs if you need extra help. All right. Um, and of course you can always just send me an email. Now the reason that I go over this and the reason I emphasize this is uh, one of the key things of being successful in this class, uh, you know there's two things to be successful in this class. And I, I guess you could probably say that's true for just about any class. But I think especially this class is just put in the work and ask questions when you get lost. If you do that, you're going to be fine. I can virtually guarantee that. All right. So just keep up with the work, keep up with the assignments, attend class, do the readings, look at the examples, work on the labs, and if there's something you don't understand, ask about it. If you do that, you will be successful in this class. I guarantee it. And by the way, that's probably true for most of my classes and most of anyone's classes. So if you do that, you'll be in good shape. Therefore, 
I want to make available for people with all different sorts of situations. That's one of the great pleasures of teaching at a community college is everyone comes in with their own set of responsibilities and backgrounds. It's really a diverse group of people that attend community colleges. And that's, that's fun. That's, that's a good thing. That's one of the things I like about teaching at a community college. Uh, but they have a lot of responsibilities. A lot of people work, a lot of people have families, and so on. And therefore, I try to give a lot of different options for ways to get a hold of me. I try to, if you will, remove any excuse that you have for not being able to ask me a question. You can't make it to office hours? Fine. Tell me when you are available, and we can Skype, or we can talk over the phone, or we can exchange emails, or whatever. So I try to give as many possibilities as possible for you to be able to contact me so that if you have questions, I'll be able to answer them. All right? And again, the wild card is if nothing else works, let me know and we'll figure something out. So that's sort of the point of this whole top of the syllabus. Description. Um, we put these on the syllabus because we have to. All right? This is directly from our catalog. But they are important. They sort of focus us. They're, they're the whole reason that we're here, is to be able to learn these things. So sometimes it's good to have in mind what sort of the end game is, what the, what the goals are of this course. So we have these listed here. Um, and they're important. You should, you should read through them. Uh, text and materials, um, you need, uh, this is a textbook. Um, you do need uh, something to store um, your work on, because if you're working on it here, if you save it on a computer upstairs, it won't be there when you come in the next time. All right? When the computers reboot, they wipe themselves clean and start with a fresh version um, uh, of the disk image. And therefore, if you save something today, it's not going to be there the next time you're there. In fact, if you were to accidentally reboot your computer, you'd lose it. Therefore, you want to make sure that you save the stuff that you're working on. And I would suggest, you know, those USB drives are so cheap these days, you know. You don't need a huge uh, one, just go and buy an inexpensive one, and I'm sure it will be more than enough space. Um, other things you can do, you can email it to yourself, whatever. Just make sure that you take a copy of the stuff that you are working on. Um, all work will be turned in via Canvas. So you will upload to the Dropbox um, the assignments that you work on. If you um, have questions on how to do that, or questions like how to attach a file or something along, that, along those lines, please let me know. Canvas will be used to communicate with students. So therefore, it's important to check Canvas um, even the days that we're not here. You don't necessarily need to check it every day, but you know, maybe check it like the day between classes, or maybe check it you know, at least once between Wednesday and Monday. Um, the reason for this is I post announcements if for whatever reason um, I'm not going to be here for class. I always lead off with that example. That way that will sure to be motivate people to, to check Canvas. But uh, if I know, for example, I'm not going to be here for a class, I'll post uh, that information. On occasion, I'll get asked a question in class that I don't know the answer for or I struggle with or whatever. Um, you know, I just, you know, just can't quite think of the answer or whatever. And sometimes I'll post um, that sort of thing. Or sometimes I'll, I'll make a misstatement or have something that's incorrect uh, in class and someone will point it out to me and I'll post an announcement to cover that. So I'll use that to communicate with the class. And it's the expectation that you'll read them. So if I post an announcement to Canvas, I won't necessarily go and talk about it in class unless people have questions about it. All right, instructor's approach. There's a long list of things here. Um, it boils down to the fact that this is your class. We have a fairly small class. Uh, even when you combine all the sections together, we have, you know, an average size class, you know. Um, and the old saying that teachers have is that if one person has a question, there's a good chance that other people have the questions too. So please don't hesitate to ask questions in the middle of the lecture if I say something you don't understand or you didn't hear me right, or you can't me read my writing, or whatever, please ask. All right? Because again, there's a good chance that other people might have the exact same issue. Uh, yes? Oh, 
Okay. Um, well, that's unfortunate. Um, I can. Um, I, I don't really know um, what that means. The program I'm using. I'm just doing it in a web browser. But do keep in mind that that if you go and simply read the syllabus online, you can read everything that I'm I'm talking about here. All right. So. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. All right. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, ask. That was a perfect example of that. Congratulations for, for following directions uh, over in, in North Ridgeville. Excellent example of that. Um, there's a whole slew of campus policies that I don't really go into in details. You can read them in the student handbook. You know, you're expected to know policies about this college or at least be able to find them and look them up. So I, I don't think it does me or any of us any good to simply repeat the catalog. You can go and get the most recent version of the policies um, online. Instructors policies, and this is something I agonize about because I have a little bit of a different approach than, than some teachers. There are some teachers that say, you know, if the assignment is due at midnight on August 31st, if it is in 1201 on September 1st, then it's late, no credit, or something extreme like that. Uh, I understand that people have different responsibilities and for whatever reason. Or I understand that you might be struggling with a particular topic and having a hard time getting an assignment done. So I aim to be as flexible as humanly possible as far as late assignments go. So if something is late, if it's not late by much, I may not deduct at all. All right? Especially if you've been communicating with me. You know, and again, if it's something personal, you don't need to get into details. You know, I have a family issue and I won't be able to get it in today. I'll get it in Friday or something like that. All right? That would be, that would be just enough and I'm okay with that. All right? You don't need to get into details. Or I'm having a hard time with this. Can you help me with with such and such and I can't make it in until your office hours on Tuesday and it's due today. You know, what do I do? Well, come in Tuesday, we'll talk about it, fix it, and then turn it in and everything will be okay. I have no problem being lenient for late points as far as that because frankly, I'm interested in what you know by the end of the course. All right? And if there's a particular concept that takes you a couple days longer to learn, than other folks in this class, I have no problem with that. What's important is what you come out of this class knowing, not where you at are at every single point of the class. What I do have a problem with is people that literally seem to disappear in the last week of the class, like turn in lab one, lab two, lab three. I will even give credit. I will give some credit at least, even if you do that. Because if you did the work, you deserve credit. But in situations like that, I think it's more than reasonable for me to say, I'm going to deduct some points. I have no idea why you are late this much. Um, you know, you, you get credit, you get some credit, but you're not going to get full credit. The bottom line, again, comes down to communication. And you don't have to communicate anything that you're not comfortable with communicating to me, if it's a personal issue or family issue or work issue. But just keep me in the loop. Just let me know if you're running late on something. Or again, if you're having trouble understanding uh, it, work with me. Ask me questions. Send me email. I will say this, though. If you're late on a couple assignments throughout the semester, that makes really no difference at all to me. If you continue to be late every single assignment, there's a sign that there's something that needs to be corrected. All right, because as lenient as I am, there comes a point where stuff is due and I got to turn grades in. All right, and I can't really be lenient on, except under extreme situations in a case like that. All right, and uh, so if you're late on lab one and late on lab two and late on lab three, that's a sign maybe you need to spend more time working on the assignments. Maybe you need to ask more questions. Just talk with me and we'll figure out what we need to do. All right. So I have this long dissertation on that topic that you can read. Final grade will be based on the following activities. Homework, 
and a project. And the project is broken down into two parts, a design and a completed part. And that is, should be 100%, and then you get 90, 80, 70s for ABs, and so on. Here's the schedule along with the day that assignments are due. So there's nothing due this week. All right. The first assignment is due the Wednesday of week two. So um, assignment due the Wednesday of, Wednesday of indicated week. So lab one, that first assignment is due next Wednesday, a week from this coming Wednesday. All right, and that's how it will be. There'll be an assignment virtually every week, uh, and uh, except for a couple weeks there where your assignment is to do a portion of the project. All right. Okay, that's the syllabus. Any questions about this? Again, this is meant to be the highlights. This is the, the, the preview of the syllabus. Do read it on your own. Now, we also have modules, and there'll be a module for each week along with a module for the project. I'm just going to go down and look at the project now. Just be aware that you have a semester project. All right? So one of the things that you should do this week is read through this material. All right? I'm not going to spend any time going over it today. We will spend time going over it in a future class. But I just want to introduce to you the fact that, that we have um, a project. So read through that. Uh, a, a few weeks into the semester, I'll spend some time talking about what you need to do to complete this. So read through this. There will also be a module every week. And the module will contain a sort of a to-do list, the stuff that I expect you to read, study, so on. Maybe some other things. And then a lab assignment. So if we look at the to-do to this week, there's a list of the stuff, the goals that you are to have, what activities you have, and then finally, your lab assignment. is actually out of date, so I'm going to correct that. All right, one of the things this week that you are to read is fair use guidelines. In other words, we do websites in this class. Um, some of the websites you have, uh, you get to choose a topic that you're going to do, all right? And you might want images um, on your web pages. So let's say you decided to do a, a web page about the Olympics. All right. Well, probably you didn't fly down to Rio uh, and were there to take pictures. So you might want to use pictures that you find on the internet. The question is, is, is that legal to do? Are you violating copyright law by taking someone else's picture and putting them on your web page? Well, there, that's, a, that's a complicated question to answer, believe it or not. Uh, and again, I'm not a lawyer. Um, but within an educational context, think of it like quoting a book on a term paper. Are you allowed to quote and use someone else's words on a term paper? Well, of course you are. Provided what? Provided that you don't take too much and provided that you cite your source that you say, hey, this is from such and such book. All right, these aren't my words. If you try to pass something off as your words when it's not, that's plagiarism, and that's a crime. That's a crime whether you do it in school or whether you do it in the real world. All right, so if I found a picture of the Olympics that I wanted to use, I could use it, provided I didn't take too many images from the site, 
and provided that I gave credit and said, image from olympics.org or whatever. And this fair use guideline sort of talks about what you need to do and, and how much you're allowed to take. So review that. The bottom line is cite your sources. You know, if you do that, you're probably going to be okay. All right? And again, it's not like I am, you know, going to be nitpicking, but, you know, gee, it says you can only take um, five images and you took six. Therefore, I'm calling the FBI. All right? Um, it's a case that if you post something that clearly isn't your work and you haven't cited it, that's when I, that's when I have a problem. Finally, we have the last assignment. And the last assignment I'll spend a minute talking about. Um, and you can start it in lab, even though we're not going to cover everything that you need to know to complete it today. You're going to create a simple web page that has information about three topics. HTML, HTML5, and CSS. So, you can begin gathering information about these topics. So, even if you don't know how to create a web page yet, um, which I don't expect you to be able to. It's the first day of class, and we haven't talked about that yet. But you can still go online and research these topics. If you do know a little bit about web development, and we're going to talk a little bit about it today, and uh, in addition, you can always cheat and read your textbook, all right? Um, if you do those things, then if you want to get started on it, you're welcome to. But, but after, by, by the end of class on Wednesday, you'll have enough uh, information to, to finish this. So you'll simply make a web page about these topics. All right, that's your, your first assignment. All right, any questions about this material? I should probably take attendance. And Oh, this is great. Except I really can't take attendance because this is this monitor is too small and stuff is overlapping. How about this? Can you pass around a sign up sign uh, sheet? Um, I think there's only two people in North Ridgeville, and you are both there. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. All right, hi. <laughs> uh, you, should, you should see something uh, about if they can fix the camera so it's not pointed in the empty seat so I can tell if you guys are having a party or if you, you snuck out or, or whatever. All right? Okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know. All right, I get it. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, it's, it's more distracting than anything for me, but uh, I guess it's not a huge deal. If you're comfortable with it, then, then that's, that's fine. All right, making web pages. Um, I imagine that we have all seen web pages before, of course. And let's look, uh, speaking of Olympics, let's pick up and go to the olympics.org site. Now you'll notice here, on this page, you can see a lot of things. And we can point to the different elements that exist on a web page. There are images. All right, here's an image. That's an image. These little things are images. There are links. And you can tell they're a link because a couple of things. They change colors when you put your mouse on them, and the pointer changes. And if I click on it, I go to another page. There is plain text. Like, for example, if I look at this, that's not a link. 
All right, I can click on it all day and nothing happens. All right. And on some other websites, there can be video, there can be audio, there can be all sorts of, of things. So there's different kind of stuff on web pages. All right. Yet a web page is simply, if we look at it, and you can view the source code, you can view the code of any web page by simply clicking View Page Source. And you can notice here that really it's just a plain old text document. Now there's a lot of stuff in it to be sure. But we can spot some of the stuff on it. For example, Romanoff and Snyder take final golds of the Rio 2016 wrestling competition. We can pick out certain pieces of text and we can see the names of images and so on and so forth. So we have a plain text document that has a bunch of stuff in it. All right. And yet, when we view that web page that is in the browser, we don't see plain text. We actually see images and links and all that. How is that done? How does, does a plain text document become sort of a multimedia document with images and text and links and so on? Yes. Okay, that, that's a good, that, that's, a, that's a part of it. The, the statement was is that this is saved as a HTML document. That tells the browser that it's HTML and therefore follow the rules of HTML. HTML, by the way, is the language of web pages. And HTML, the letters stand for hypertext, markup language. And hypertext markup language is the way by which ordinary text gets turned by the browser into a completed web page. What does hypertext mean? Hypertext means more than regular text. In other words, it's not just words. It's words that contain links and images and other multimedia. So like if you, you, you study, or not you study, you read sci-fi or watch sci-fi, they'll talk about hyperspace. That's somehow more than regular space or beyond regular space. So this is beyond regular text, this hypertext. Markup language means that the text is marked up. What do I mean by marked up? I mean this. All right. Let me find a sheet of paper here. I hope this person doesn't mind me using their exam. Is it? Ooh, is any? Oh, this is from spring 2011. I, I would hope that their exam has been changed since 2011. If not, and if any of you are in Econ 152, then you might want to take notes on this section uh, of today's lecture. Let's say this was a book and not an exam. Whoops. Let's say this was the Econ textbook. All right, and let's say that this right here was important. If I'm a student and my teacher says this is important, it's going to be on the test, I might do something like I might take a highlighter and highlight it. All right, hey, that's important. So when I go back and study, I know, hey, spend some time to study that. All right. On the other hand, if they say, well, hey, the book was published in 2011, therefore this is no longer relevant, I might put an X through it. Let's say even if I found something interesting and I wanted to go back and read more about it for my semester project or something like that, I might put a star next to it let's say. I'm actually taking a 
pen or a highlighter. I'm actually marking up the text. What does it mean when I mark up the text? It means I'm giving it some additional meaning. I'm saying, yeah, each of these are paragraphs in my book, but they have special significance. This thing is important because it's going to be on the test. This is not important because it's out of date. This is something interesting that I might be able to use in my project. So I'm actually marking it up, and I'm giving some indication of the importance of it. Well, that's exactly what we do on web pages, except we don't use a highlighter and so on. We use what are called tags. All right, we tag it. All right. So, we tag it through the use of what are called HTML tags. And I'm going to create a simple fragment of a web page. All right, this isn't a complete web page. We'll finish up the web page on Wednesday. But this is a start of a web page that we'll talk about more of and we'll finish up and so on. Let's say I want to make my own page about the Olympics. All right, I'm going to go in to an application called Notepad. Now, Notepad is a very simple text editor. And again, you don't have to use Notepad. There's Notepad++, which you can download for free. If you have a Mac, there's other, uh, there, there's other uh, applications that you can use. Uh, text Wrangler is a good one. Um, oh, one escapes me. Uh, Komodo is a good editor, and so on. You can use any of these. But here's the idea. They're plain text editors. They're not things like Dreamweaver, where you go in and you sort of drag and drop and create your web page that way. Some of you may have used those in the past or be familiar with them. I avoid them because by using things like that, you don't really learn how to make a web page. You learn how to use Dreamweaver or whatever. So I'm going to go into a simple application notepad, and I'm going to go in and I'm going to create the start of a web page. So. Let's say I want my web page to look like this. I'm going to sketch it out first. It's always a good idea to do, is to sort of design, sort of figure out what you're going to do first and then go in and do it. It's just like if you're writing a term paper, it's better to outline it and then go and write the, the paper instead of just trying to sit down at the typewriter and bang out a paper. So I'm going to sketch out what I want my page to look like. So. Maybe I want my web page to look like this. Sort of a banner on the top that says 2016 Rio Olympics. Then maybe a secondary header of gymnastics. And then maybe underneath that, men and women's. There may be another secondary header, basketball, men, women. And I could do that all the way down the line. All right. Maybe I have an opening ceremonies and then a closing ceremony. If I was going to draw this like an outline, I would do this. My Main outline is about the Rio Olympics. A is opening ceremonies. B, gymnastics. Men, women. And then I'd have C, D, E, and so on. You can almost make an outline just like you would do for a paper for this. All right. So now that I have an idea of how I want, I'm going to actually go and create the HTML for it. Now I have to somehow tag the text. I can't simply go and do this. I can't simply go and type in 2016 Rio Olympics.
opening ceremony gymnastics men women can simply do that because there's nothing that indicates like what the structure is you know is this the top level thing or is are these two things together on the top level and is basketball under women or is you know it doesn't you can't really figure out just by looking this this isn't tagged it's just like when I had my book before and I just had a bunch of words on it I didn't tag it to give any additional information in HTML, you use tags to indicate what that means. So for example, this Rio Olympics is the top level heading. So I tag it this way. And all tags look like this. First of all, the tags come in pairs. All right, I have a starting tag and I have an ending tag. The difference between the starting and ending tag is there's a slash at the start of the ending tag. The tag starts with a less than sign. It has the name of the tag and then it ends with a greater than sign. Now we're going to talk about some extensions of this later on but Simply put, all tags are going to sort of look like this. There might be some additional stuff in there too, but they're going to look sort of like this. And then the ending tag looks like this. All right. Um, H1 means that it is a top level heading. All right. H1. H for heading. 1 means first level, top level. That means that it is like the top level heading that you have on an outline. All right. Now, if you remember our outline, opening ceremonies was underneath the top level. So what tag do you think we're going to use here? H2. That indicates that, hey, this is sort of a secondary heading. All right. Rio Olympics is a top level heading. Opening ceremonies is underneath that. What would gymnastics be, if you remember our outline? Pardon me? It would also be an H2. Good, good, good answer. Sometimes people would think, well, that's the first heading, the second heading, and the third heading, so this would be an H3. That's not correct. The number of the heading relates to the level that it's on, on an outline. So this gymnastics is a second level heading. So it would be also an H2. Now men is underneath gymnastics, so it would be what? An H3. Women is also underneath gymnastics. So that would be an H3. Basketball, again, if you remember the outline, basketball isn't underneath Gymnastics, it's underneath Olympics, so that would also be an H2. And then we have H3, H3. And finally an H2.
so. That is the HTML code that represents this. We've marked up, we've taken that plain text, just the words, and we've added some additional meaning to it and say, these aren't just a random string of words that are just going to appear on the page. They have a structure to them. They represent sort of the data organized in a certain way. So we use these tags to do it. Now, what if you have something that isn't a heading? You know, we've only talked about headings in this case. You know, a web page is going to have more than just headings, right? It's going to have um, some text. So if it's just a plain block of text, it's going to be in a series of paragraph tags. So the P tag indicates a paragraph. So the U.S. women's gymnastic team won a whole bunch of medals. And we could go on and put whatever we wanted to in there. Now again, key things here. And we'll, we'll, again, we'll revisit this next time and we'll, we'll finish up and we'll add the rest of the tags that make the page. All right? But I want to get this far today. All right? And then we'll go further on Wednesday. A few things about tags. Notice what they look like. Less than sign, name of the tag, and then greater than sign. They come in pairs. This closes this tag, starting tag, ending tag, which means that everything from here to here is considered that top level heading. Everything from here to here is a second level heading, and so on and so on and so forth. All right? These tags are predefined. In other words, I didn't make these up. One of the things that we'll do in this class is we'll learn what some of the different tags are and what they mean. That's one of the big work, uh, the biggest work uh, part of this class is learning all the different tags. All right. A, the first set of tags we're looking at are headers. And again, remember, there's H1, H2, H3. It goes all the way down to H6. That doesn't mean that you can only have six headers on your page. It means that there are six levels of headers. If you think about it, that's pretty complicated to have six levels of headers in an outline. All right. If you have that many, you probably should break it up into a second page. All right. Finally, we have a paragraph tag. Now, what I want to close with today is how we save this so it's viewed as a web page. One of the students mentioned that we have to save it as, a, as an HTML file. That way the browser knows that it's a web page and, and, and displays it as such. So I'm going to go up under File, Save. And I'm going to change where it says save as type. I'm going to change it to say all files. So instead of .txt, all files. Then I'm going to put it somewhere. I'm going to put it on the desktop. And I'm going to give it a name that ends in .html. So I'm going to type in olympics.html. So I change save as type to all files file name, .html. Then I click Save. When I do that then, I'll have on the desktop a page. And notice that the icon for it is a little e. That indicates Internet Explorer is the default program. So in other words, Windows knows that this is a web page. And if I double click it, I won't see the code. I'll see the HTML. Um, or I'll see the, the browser displaying the HTML the way I intended it to. So if I double click on that, I get I get yelled at. But then I get this. All right? And notice what I get. Top level heading is the biggest, right? It makes sense. If it's a, if it's a top level, it's going to be a, sort of the most important, so it makes it the biggest. Second level headings are a little bit smaller. It might be a little hard to tell, but they are a little bit smaller. Third level headings are smaller still. 
And then finally, my regular paragraph is just plain text. It's not especially bigger than the rest of them. And so on down the line. All right? So, one thing to keep in mind, and I get this every semester, is I'll have students say about, well, which file do you want? The notepad file or the web page file? There's only one file here. This and this are the same file. I'm just looking at it two different ways. It's like the difference between a photograph of you and an x-ray of you, right? Photograph of you shows what you, your surface looks like. The x-ray shows what your insides look like, all right? This is like the x-ray, shows you the code, shows you what the insides of the page looks like. This is the page that will be viewed via a browser. Now, if you, had it, if, you, if you understood this and you want to try this in lab, you're welcome to, and I'll be happy to help you with any questions that you have. If you're still a little fuzzy on this, you know, read the book. Um, but know that Wednesday we will talk about this a lot more, all right, um, and, and we'll finalize it. You can at the very least start looking and get it, gathering information about those three topics, HTML, HTML5, and CSS. Yes? Yes. Yes. In other words, um, in other words when, when you save it as a .html, then that's up to Windows to decide what program to open it under. Right. So, yeah, there's not anything special for Chrome or whatever. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a good point to remind me. If, if, if they do not, um, then, then I will usually try to remember the question. Uh, that particular question was, when you save a file like that, does it automatically open it up with the default web browser on the computer? And the answer is yes. If you save it as an HTML file, it will be opened by the default browser on the computer. You don't need to open it, you don't need to say anything special to have it open with the default. All right. I will also post this example to Canvas. So again, I know sometimes on the screen it's a little hard to read, um, but if you get the basic idea, uh, you can always go back and look at the finished example later on. What we'll do next time is we'll finish this one up because again, keep in mind this is a fragment of a web page. This is not a completed web page. There's still some more tags we have to put into it to make it a completed web page. And we'll do that on Wednesday. Are there any other questions? All right. We'll see you in lab. Uh, North Ridgeville, um, if you do want to communicate with me during lab, um, if you send me an email, we can figure out and talk to them there. We, I think we can set up Skype between the two stations uh, if you're going to stay and work in the lab. I'm sorry, repeat. Pardon me? No, I have not. Okay. All right, just let me know what I can do to help, like, if you have questions in lab. All right, sounds good. All right, bye-bye.